O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, and made you into nations and tribes that you may come to know each other. Verily the most honored of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. And God has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me greet you with the greeting of Islam, which is peace be upon you. It's not war, be upon you. My name is Fadl Solomon. Fadl Solomon, I am 45 years old, even though I look like 65. <laughs> I'm married, I have two children and only one wife. I'm also the director of Bridges Foundation, which is an international organization specializing in bridging the gap between Muslims and non-Muslims, especially after 9-11 and also in training Muslim public speakers and presenters. We trained so far 12,570 in 17 countries. Uh, today's uh, presentation is called, Is Islam a Religion of Peace or a Religion of War? Which later on was transferred into a documentary, which I hope most of you watched it, called um, Jihad on Terrorism. Uh, but allow me quickly, before I go through this, uh, uh, issue, uh, if Islam is a religion of peace or a religion of war, to do a small introduction just in order to make sure that we will be all on the same bandwidth. Because I will be using some expressions in this uh, documentary, I, I'm sorry, in this presentation, uh, and I'm, I want to make sure that we all understand it uh, the same way. I will mention the word Allah. I will mention the word Islam. I will mention the word Quran. I will mention the word Muhammad. And I really want quickly to go through those four definitions in order to make sure that you really understand what, what, what they mean for Muslims. First, let's talk about Islam. What is Islam? Uh, well, if we define such an Arabic word, we need to do that uh, uh, linguistically and idiomatically. Well, we can say that linguistically, the word Islam comes from the root of the word Salama, which is in Arabic language, the same root from which you can have three different words that have three different meanings. The first one is Istislam, submission. The second one is Salama, which is purity. And the third one is Salam, which is peace. Islamically or idiomatically, which is really very surprising that the word Islam carries is actually a combination of those three words. The word Islam means that if any person fully submits himself or herself to the will of God and worships God purely without any association with God, worships God alone, he or she will live in peace and harmony in this life and in the hereafter. So why am I saying harmony? Because actually Muslims believe that everything worships God. Everything, even animals, even plants. Those are two verses in the Quran. One of them says, everything around you knows how to worship and how to pray. It's just that you don't know how they do it. And those verses actually are very inspiring for me when I uh, go uh, to the lake with my uh, children and I see the ducks swimming in a V shape like that. I say, oh my God, can this be the way they pray congregation? like us in the mosque, and this duck in the front is the imam duck or something. <laughs> and also when I hear the birds twittering in the very early morning and exactly at sunset, I say, oh my God, can this be their two prescribed times of prayer? Like we have uh, five prescribed times of prayer. And subhanAllah, it's just that this makes me feel like I am worshiping God and the universe is worshiping. So I feel like I'm in harmony with the universe. This means that the word Muslim in the Arabic language doesn't mean literally a follower of Prophet Muhammad. If you just look at the word Islam, it is the only religion in the world which is not called after someone, nor after any group of people or a tribe, nor after any geographic region. Hinduism after Hind India, geographic region. Judaism after the tribe of Judas. Christianity after Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Buddhism after Buddha. Islam after who? 
Me? Solomon? <laughs> the whole world knows how much Muslims love Muhammad so much, but it's very offensive for them to be called Muhammadans. Why? If they love him. It's because they don't believe that they are Muhammadans, they are Muslims like him, and like Jesus and Moses and Abraham and Noah and all those. So that's about the word Islam. Now let's talk about the word Allah. Some people think that the word Allah is actually, uh, it means the God of the Muslims. Or that he's like a cube-shaped building that exists in Mecca and they keep circumambulating him or something. No. Actually, the word Allah is an Arabic word that means the one true God. And when I say it's an Arabic word that means the one true God, I mean that even Arab Christians and Arab Jews use the same word to call the deity as well. This word in Arabic equals the word Ella in Hebrew. which exists even twice in the Quran. To prove this, this is the first page of the Arabic Christian Bible. Here, this is the word Genesis, at the queen. So this is the first paragraph of Genesis. If you can, let's play a small game. I know that most of you don't know Arabic. Can you figure out how many times this word Allah here exists here in this paragraph? Try to count with me. One, two, three, four, five, six times. 17 times in the whole page of the Arabic Christian Bible. Thousands of times all through the Bible. So when Muslims say there is no God except Allah, it's not only that this shouldn't be offensive for people from Christian and Jewish backgrounds. No, this actually unites us. But Muslims believe that Allah is unique. That there is nothing like unto him. One of the verses of the Quran, there is nothing like unto him, which means that he is the creator of man, so he doesn't look like any man. He's the creator of animals, he doesn't look like any animal. He's the creator of plants, he doesn't look like any plant. Anything that your mind can imagine, he is beyond. I will also use the word Quran. What is the Quran? I know that most of you are from a Christian and a Jewish background, even those of of you who are of no faith, but at least from a Christian background or a Jewish background. And you guys have the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? The Quran is the last testament. The Quran is the last revelation of God. And it is the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice. And the Quran deals with all subjects that concern human beings, including wisdom, doctrine, worship, and law. And there are two main basic themes for the Quran. The first one is the relationship between God and his creation and the relationship between people, one and another of them. So it's vertical relationship and horizontal relationship. Okay? And the Quran provides guidelines for a just society, proper human conduct, and equitable economic principles. But just guidelines. The details are left for people to decide. Muslims believe in all the scriptures of God. The Torah that was given to Moses, peace be upon him. The gospel that was given to Jesus Christ, son of Mary, peace be upon him. And the Quran that was given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, etc., etc. Because we also believe that there were other scriptures sent before those scriptures. The scrolls of Abraham, the Psalms of David. Let me show you what the Quran says about those books. Anything about the Torah? The Quran says... Surely we did send down the Torah to Moses, therein was guidance and light, by which the prophets who submitted themselves to Allah's will judged the Jews. So the Torah was mentioned in the Quran as a source of guidance and light. Anything about the gospel? We sent Jesus, son of Mary, confirming the Torah that had come before him, and we gave him the gospel in which was guidance and light, and confirmation of the Torah. So the gospel that was given to Jesus Christ was also mentioned in the Quran as a source of guidance and light. Muslims believe that Archangel Gabriel carried those books 100% correct to the messengers of God. And when Muslims say that they believe in all the books, I mean they believe in the original texts that were sent to any one of those prophets. But as soon as man contributes to these texts, for example, by translation, it cannot be considered divine because there is a human contribution. So if someone tells you, let me give you a gift. This is a, a Norwegian Quran. 
or an English Quran, correct him, tell him, I attended for Bridges Foundation, and I learned that there is nothing as so-called Norwegian Quran or English Quran. The Quran is only the Arabic text. Say a Norwegian translation. Say an English translation, but it's not the Quran. And for your own information, we have very good translations for the Quran and terrible translations for the Quran. I'm not attacking the Quran like that. I'm attacking a human work. And of course, this applies on all other scriptures. The original book is the original text sent in the original language to any one of those prophets. This is a sample from the Quran, which actually is a very dear sample of the Quran to my heart, because it's an answer to a question that I used to have in my mind for so many years. For so many years when I saw people fighting each other, I said, why didn't God create us from different, for, why did God create us from different backgrounds? And people are fighting each other. Uh, whites and blacks, for centuries, there were problems between whites and blacks. Uh, men and women, those who are married will understand. Uh, Arabs, today, problems. Pakistanis, problems. Maybe Koreans will be doing problems. Wasn't it a better idea that we could have been all from one background? Same sex, same race, same color, speaking one language, eating the same food? Like we could have been all uh, white, speaking Italian and eating pizza. That's it. The, the world could have been more peaceful. And then because in the Quran you can find many answers to the, any question about the creation actually. I found the answer to my question. God Almighty said, O mankind, he's not saying O Muslims. He's speaking to each and every one in this room. O mankind, we created you from male and female and made you into nations with an S and tribes with an S that you may know each other. And I stopped at this point and I said to myself, oh my God, imagine that we could have been all from one background, all of us like Chinese, speaking Chinese, eating Chinese food, this, this could have been good for me actually. But this world could have been so boring. No chance to get to know each other and discover each other. Uh, you won't be here today listening about something new. Many businesses would go out of business like hotels, airlines, I hope Seth. They denied me boarding yesterday, anyway. Uh, actually, because travel where? See what? It's a boring world. So diversity is a blessing that people are abusing by fighting each other, by attacking each other. God said, I created you from different backgrounds in order to get to know each other. And the rest of the verse says, surely the most honored of you in the sight of Allah are the Arabs. Not the Arabs, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the Jews. Not even the Jews. Aha, uh -huh. surely the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Doesn't matter if male or female, from which nation or which tribe, if you are more righteous and pious and good, you are more honored. Doesn't matter what your race is, your sex is, or your color, or your language. This is the essence of Islam. And that's why this verse did not start by all Muslims or all you who believe. It is all mankind. I will say Muhammad too. The last definition now is Muhammad. But to talk about Muhammad, I have to talk about the definition of prophethood in Islam. Muslims believe in only one God. Muslims also believe in only one humankind because there is no difference between us. We don't believe that men are better than women. We don't believe that whites are better than blacks. We don't believe that Arabs are better than Indians. So one God, one humankind. This means one sender and one recipient. If there's only one sender and only one recipient, why would anyone say and think that the same sender, God, will send to the same recipient, the humankind, contradicting messages? So Muslims believe that it was always one religion and no S. Not religions. And it's not the religion of Muhammad. Not the religion of Jesus. Not the religion of Moses. It is the religion of God. Allah in Arabic, Allah in Hebrew, God with a capital G in English, Dieu in French, that he communicated to the humankind once through Muhammad, once before him through Jesus, once before him through Moses, once before him through Abraham. So one God, one humankind, one religion, many messengers. So... 
One of the verses of the Quran say, Muhammad is just a messenger like many others who came before him and died. Another verse says, Jesus, son of Mary, is just a messenger who, like uh, many messengers who came before him and died. This is really what we believe, because I know that some of you may say, who says that this is true? Maybe this guy is uh, lying, and when those Muslims turn their backs to us, they just believe in Muhammad and the Quran. No. I said the Quran is the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice. The Quran tells us twice, say, we believe in Allah. We believe in Allah. And the revelation given to us, which is the Quran. And the revelation given to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes. And the revelation given to Moses and Jesus. And the revelation given to all the prophets from their Lord. We make no difference between one and another of them. And we submit to Allah, which means, and we are Muslims. So I can't be Muslim if I exclude um, Jacob. I'm not Muslim. If I exclude Isaac, I'm not Muslim. I have to accept them all. We don't pick and choose. So when I say Muhammad, I don't want you to think that I am talking about the founder of Islam. No. Muhammad is the final messenger of Islam. A colleague of Jesus and Moses. A graduate of the same school from which they graduated. The school of God. Okay. His traditions are called the Sunnah. So sometimes you will hear the word Sunnah. Sunnah means the traditions of Prophet Muhammad. And it is considered to be the number two source of Islamic knowledge and legislation after the Quran. And his people used to love him so much before he became a prophet. Pagans, idolaters, used to respect him and call him the trustworthy and the truthful. After he became a prophet, things changed. They tried to stop him by all means. They tortured him and his followers. They tried to assassinate him several times. They killed many of his followers. The first martyr in Islam was not a man at all. She was a woman called Lady Sumaya. She was jabbed by a spear in her private parts by the, the first Islamophobe. It's called Abu Jahl. And that was the first Islamophobe. And they negotiated with him. They said, look, what do you need? You have to stop spreading this message that there is no God except Allah. We are not yet ready to free the slaves or free the women. What do you need? Money, we can make you the most rich. Women, we can marry you from the most beautiful of all women. Power, we can make you the king of Arabia. And his famous statement was, if you put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand to quit, I won't quit this message until the message is conveyed or I die conveying it. And he refused to compromise his freedom of speech. And freedom of speech is one of the topics that we can talk about also, by the way, if you want, after this presentation. Uh, he's the most beautiful example because for Muslims, he was not just a prophet. He was also a merchant, a father, a husband, a teacher, a politician, a negotiator, and a warrior. I'm not going to hide that. It's on the internet now. Of course, he was a warrior. But he also taught Muslims how to fight. And that's exactly what I'm going to tell you in the rest of our presentation. But you need to know that he was also a reformer. 14 centuries ago, he convinced Jews, Muslims, and pagans to sit together and sign one pact, saying that if our city is ever under attack from outside, we will all fight side by side, defending our city at a time when loyalty was only for the tribe. He was able to convince all those people to transcend their tribal differences and start thinking for the first time as a single society. Ban Ki-moon couldn't do that today. <laughs> With all respect, of course. He gave hope to billions of people because he had some very inspiring teachings like this one, which always has shaken me. It says, if you are planting a tree and the end of the world came, what do you go? Leave it and run? No. Plant it quickly. It may not make any sense to many of us. Why? Because, excuse me, this is the end of the world. Why should I be planting trees? It's not only that I'm not going to eat from it. There are no coming generations. But this explains the system in Islam. In Islam, people on the day of judgment will not be held accountable for the results, but rather for the effort. 
Here in this life, you are held accountable for the effort, which is fair because your boss cannot know the, uh, the uh, I'm sorry. Here in this life, you are held accountable for the results, but not the effort, which is fair because the boss cannot know the effort. Your boss tells you, come here, show me the numbers, show me the sales, show me the production. But God doesn't care about the sales or production or numbers. He cares about your effort. Keep doing effort until the last moment on earth. And he will be holding you accountable for the effort, but not the uh, results. There are some non-Muslim philosophers who spoke very highly about Prophet Muhammad because they were fair when they read his biography. Like this man, who is actually a French uh, historian called Lamartine. Lamartine is the author of L'Histoire de la Turquie, which means the history of the Turks. He said, if greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are the three criteria of a human genius who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad. This man was a non-Muslim. Mahatma Gandhi, this man of peace, he said, I became more than convinced that it was not the sword that won a place for Islam in those days in the scheme of life. It was the rigid simplicity, the utter self-effacement of the Prophet, his scrupulous regard for his pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his intrepidity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God and in his own mission. And the last one that I'm going to show you what he said about Prophet Muhammad is Wolfgang Goethe, the most famous European poet. He said he is a prophet and not a poet, and therefore his Quran is to be seen as a divine law, not as a book of a human being made for education or entertainment. Before we talk about jihad, we have to talk about justice, and this is about 20 minutes in the documentary Jihad on Terrorism that were eliminated because the film was already long. It was already one hour, 40 minutes. So we eliminated this part, which is a very important part. And I was so sorry to, to remove it, actually. But I had to submit to the directors. We had three directors directing this film. So we have to talk about justice before we talk about jihad. How important justice is in Islam? In Islam, justice is the reason why God sent Muhammad and the Quran with him, Jesus and the gospel with him. Moses and the Torah with him. The reason why God sent messengers and books with them is to establish justice on earth. Look, I always like questions at the end of my presentation. Except one question that you can interrupt me at any time and tell me, what's your evidence? You're not here to waste your time. And I didn't come all the way from Sri Lanka. I was there yesterday, by the way all the way to waste your time or waste my time. I'm not here to talk about or talk from my own inspirations or experiences. Excuse me. When I tell you something, I should have evidence. What's the evidence that Islam looks at justice that important that it is the reason why God sent messengers and books? The Quran is the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice. God said in the Quran, in chapter number 57, verse number 25, we sent aforetime our messengers with clear signs and sent down with them the book and the balance of knowing right from wrong that people may stand forth in justice. So the ultimate goal in Islam is justice. God said in the Quran, surely we have sent down to you, to you means he's speaking to Muhammad, the book, which is the Quran, in truth that you might judge between people by that which Allah has shown you. So be not a pleader for the, for the treacherous and argue not on behalf of those who betray themselves. This verse was sent to defend an innocent Jew. There was this uh, Muslim young man who stole something from another Muslim. And then he was afraid that he gets caught with it. So he went to a Jewish neighbor. He knocked his door. He said, can I leave this with you as a trust? The Jew said, sure. He took it. And then it looks like it was dripping some flour or something. So it was found in the, Jew, in, the, in, the, in the Jew's house. So he was brought to Prophet Muhammad as a thief. He said, I didn't steal anything. It is this Muslim who brought it to my house. The Prophet said, bring me this young man. His family came and they said, look, Prophet of Allah, 
he confessed. It's true. He stole it. But you know what? He's young. Uh, he regretted. He's not going to do that again. Please spare him and let the punishment be on the Jew. He's a Jew. Of course, the Prophet would never think about something like that, but still the Quran is telling him here, it's not even an alternative. I sent you the Quran to judge between people, not between Muslims, by that which Allah has shown you, which means by justice. So be not a pleader for the treacherous and argue not on behalf of those who betray themselves. Allah says in the Quran, O you who believe, Stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, even though it be against yourselves or your parents or your relatives. You know the Fifth Amendment in the American Constitution? You are allowed not to testify if this will hurt you or your parents or your relatives. But that's an obstruction of justice. So what can they do? Of course, the founding fathers of America has put this have put this, so what can they do? So what they did is, they did this, another legislation called the Sabina. If you are Sabine, which means if you are called to come and testify in the presence of a grand jury, you cannot abstain. Because actually, if you abstain from testifying, or if you lie in your testimony, an innocent person will be hurt. Here, God doesn't compromise. You have to testify, and you have to say the truth. Even if this will lead to your own or problems for you or your parents or your that you have to say the truth or someone else will be hurt an innocent person will be hurt i always like also to mention a small story that happened uh, in my country egypt egypt was one of the first countries that came to islam and the first ruler to rule egypt was called amr ibn al-as amr ibn al-as was actually um, one of the companions of prophet muhammad a very great person his son was racing against some uh, young people from Egypt. One of them won the race, and he was a Christian Egyptian. So there was a fight, and uh, the son of Amr ibn al-As, the ruler of Egypt, beat up the Christian Egyptian. And he told him, how come you win the son of the two noble people? His mother and his father are actually from a high lineage, from a high family, from Quraysh, from Arabia. And so the Christian took his mule and he traveled all the way to Umar ibn Khattab in Arabia to complain, to file a claim. And just this act proves that non-Muslims had confidence in the legal system. Or he won't be risking his life or, or time and travel all the way to file a complaint. Umar ibn Khattab, the caliph, he brought Amr ibn al-As, the ruler of Egypt, and his son. And the son confessed. He said, yeah, actually, I, I beat him up. I was just uh, nervous, and I, I didn't know what I'm doing. So I said, okay, no problem. Then the sharia has to be applied. Revenge. He called the Christian. He told him, take this stick. He told the son of Amr ibn al-As, take off your turban. And he told him, beat up the son of the two noble people on his head. It was a small stick. It's not, it's not something that will kill him. And then he looked at Amr ibn al-As and he said, tell me, Amr, when did we start enslaving people? Because actually, this is how Muslims looked at themselves. The first generation, the companions of Prophet Muhammad, looked at themselves as the liberators of non-Muslims. When one of them went to Persia and the leader of the Persian army argued with him, he was called Rabi ibn Amr, the uh, companion of Prophet Muhammad. He said, who are you guys who are coming from Arabia? He said, look, we are people whom God has sent to get people out from the worship of creatures to the worship of the creator and from the injustices of religions to the justice of Islam. So they looked at themselves, whether we agree with him or not, he looked at himself as a liberator, not as a killer of non-Muslims, a liberator of non-Muslims. That's why when you see what happened, you don't find that all those armies of Muslims were faced ever by a civilian resistance. 
it was only fighting the army of Persia, the army of the Romans. But even in the, because this is actually my master thesis about the history of Egypt, there's an important book called The Chronicles of Joan of Nikiu. Nikiu is actually a city in the north, in, 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 in uh, north of Cairo, which is the same uh, city that Hosni Mubarak came from, by the way. And uh, this bishop of Nikiu, who was an Orthodox Trinitarian Christian, he was a contemporary of the uh, conquest of the Roman Byzantines in Egypt by the Muslims. And he said that the Egyptian Aryans, the Aryans are the followers of Arius, who are, who are like Christians, but they rejected the Trinity and they rejected the divinity of Jesus, which makes them the type of Muslims at that time before Muhammad. Uh, he said they joined Amr ibn al-As and they joined his army in fighting the Roman Byzantines. So Egyptians joined the army of Amr ibn al-As in fighting the Roman Byzantines. And this is in the books of history of the Egyptian Orthodox Coptic Church. Now let's talk about jihad. Again, uh, the word jihad makes people panic, actually. Uh, the word jihad scares people. Uh, and I remember in 2005, I was in giving, giving my uh, presentations in Frankfurt Buch Messi, in the, the book fair of Frankfurt. And uh, every day, the, it's the biggest book fair, actually, in the world. Every, like tens of thousands uh, visit this book fair every day. So at 5 o'clock exactly when the book fair is closed, thousands of people are coming out at the same time and it becomes very uh, crowded. And it's also the rush hour in Germany at that time. So it's very hard to find a place on a train to go back home. It's very disappointing. You have to wait maybe for 20 minutes. And trains come, doors are open, no place even to step in. So there was this German journalist waiting next to me. And it looks like he saw me inside giving my presentations about Islam. So he told me, would you like me to tell you a secret? And I said, sure. Well, you know, he's German. And Germans know the secrets of Germany. So I said, go ahead. I thought that he would tell me, let's go and walk to a further station and take the train from there. But he said, if you want to find a place on the next train, when the door opens, shout loudly and say, Allahu Akbar. God told me in the Quran, 12 characteristics that I should have them in order to go to paradise. Among them is to be patient. It's, the verse says, and those who are, who, who when they are harassed by an ignorant harasser, they just say peace, which means don't respond to him. Someone is harassing you verbally, don't respond to him. The, 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 the tongue that says uh, Allah, subhanAllah, glory be to Allah, should not say like an F word or something like that. So just ignore them. Looks like he didn't like it, so he told me, would you like me to tell you another secret? I said, yes. He said, if you want to be alone on the next train, when the door opens, shout saying, jihad. I'm Muslim, but I'm Egyptian too. <laughs> I couldn't actually uh, uh, control myself. I said, look, young man, would you like me to tell you a secret? And his face turned very serious because as Muslims, our secrets are different. He's maybe expecting that we receive daily emails with the schedule of trains that we blow up or something. I said, all Muslims in the world love this word so much. He said, what? I thought only 15%. Because this is what you are, guys are told in the West, that 15% of Muslims are fanatics. 15% of Muslims are prospect suicide bombers. 15% of Muslims, this is 300 million. I said, no, man. 100% of Muslims love this word so much, we even use it to name our children. Here in your country, you can, have, you can find a three-year-old girl with uh, blue eyes and apple rosy cheeks and uh, blonde hair, and you ask her, what's your name, honey? She tells you, my name is Jihad. And this is really troubling because that's a big gap. The word that scares people in the West the word that is actually, uh, that equals terrorism in the West is a word which has a very positive connotation in the East. This is not good. So either we should stop using this word, we should stop loving this word, or you should understand what it means. But this gap is not good. And that's what made me do this film, actually. The word jihad linguistically in the Arabic language comes from the root of the word jihad, which means doing extra effort. 
So we can say that linguistically the word jihad means striving and struggling. Idiomatically, the word jihad has three main meanings. The first one is spiritual jihad, uh, which is a nonviolent struggling within oneself to live a life of virtue. You struggle against your ego to be a better person. Uh, we wake up uh, at daybreak. Daybreak now is like 5 o'clock or 5.30. Uh, and wash our hands and, and feet and uh, faces and pray while people are in their cozy beds. That's not easy. This needs jihad. You do spiritual jihad, spiritual, spiritual struggle to free your spirit from the first jail, your body, your desires. You go against your evil inclinations to be a better person. To spend in charity without showing off, that's not easy. This needs jihad, struggling to do things with sincerity. The second meaning is verbal jihad, which is to say the truth, even if it's against your own interests. The revolution in Egypt and in Tunisia, that was a type of verbal jihad. We were speaking peacefully against tyranny, and they were shooting at us. I have seen people on the 28th of January dying. They were uh, uh, firing at them fire bullets. The vehicles, the armored vehicles, were, were, were actually uh, running over us. So this is verbal jihad. You say the truth, even if, it, if this can be against your interests. Prophet Muhammad said, if, you, if the time comes that you see my nation afraid of telling a tyrant that he is a tyrant, then there is no hope for them. What do tyrants do? Tyrants kill. And he said, if you are afraid of them, tyrants, there's no hope for you. Which means, just speak. We will all die one day. Die with dignity today. Instead of getting run over by a car. But say the truth. He also said that the best of martyrs is he who was murdered by a tyrant for criticizing his tyranny. Which means, he's encouraging us to say the truth in the face of tyrants. And the third is combative jihad. Combat to establish justice, which is a supreme goal, not only in Islamic teachings, but in every civilization. If you lose your country, yeah, try to regain back your rights through peaceful means. But if you fail, you are allowed to go to the battlefield and fight and regain back your rights. The problem is with the cut and paste game, which is always played against Muslims. For example, you find people attacking Islam saying, you know what, Muslims are crazy. They have crazy things in their book. They have a verse that says, combat in the cause of Allah, instead of having love in the cause of Allah like us. But they never read the verse properly. The verse says, combat in the cause of Allah, those who combat against you. And even if we go to the battlefield, the verse continues, and do not transgress your limits, for Allah does not love transgressors. What are those limits? Those are the combat, which are the combat code or the combat orders of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You remember I told you that he was a warrior and he taught us how to fight. So number one was never kill innocent people. We have 90 main rulings in Islamic Sharia. Among them is this one. No one can be fought except a combatant. لا يقاتل إلا المقاتل. No one can be fought except a combatant. But innocent civilians are innocent civilians. Which means that what happened on 9-11 cannot be justified in Islam. What happened on 7-7 cannot be justified in Islam. What happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki cannot be justified in Islam. Innocent civilians are innocent civilians. That's a red line and they should not be targeted. So that was the number one rule in the code of combat of Prophet Muhammad. Number two is never torture prisoners of war. If Muslims are allowed to go to the battlefield, then of course they are also allowed to take captives. What do Muslims do when they take captives of war? They make them stand like that with black uh, uh, bags uh, covering their heads or make them lie naked over each other? Or what do they do to them? Muslims are not allowed to torture prisoners of war neither physically nor psychologically. And to prove this, before the Battle of Badr, which is the first battle in Islam, there was an intelligence unit the night before the battle. An intelligence unit of three companions who actually 
captured two prisoners uh, of war, uh, and there, there were two uh, persons from the army of the other, uh, from the enemy, Quraysh. And because the Muslims, that was the first battle, and that was, they were like very desperate for any information about the army, about the weapons, they started beating them up to get some information from them. And Prophet Muhammad was praying, so he was troubled by what he heard, and he ended his prayer, and he said, you torture them, they tell you nothing but lies. And the two guys were very patriotic, and they don't want five minutes? No, come on. That was the introduction. No, no, okay. But actually, I need, can, can I have like 15 minutes? Uh, we need time to have a discussion. So we will. Give me 15 minutes, please. I beg you. You started actually 15 minutes. Yeah. Can, can I? Yeah. It's a democratic country. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, 15. Uh, no, not more than this, okay? So actually, I, I will just cut it short. Muslims are not allowed to torture prisoners of war. Forget about the evidence, okay, now. Just trust me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I'll buy you coffee later. Uh, never kill animals. Never destroy crops. Never destroy infrastructures. Of course, the prophet didn't say infrastructures, but it's not allowed to poison wells. And poisoning a well is a destruction from the infrastructure. Uh, he also said, never disturb birds in their nests. I know that this sounds funny a little bit, but I didn't understand it until I read the history of the Crusaders. And I saw the first crusade coming through Europe. They didn't come by the sea. And coming through Europe, I read about the plundering and looting and raping even Christian countries like Bulgaria and Romania. And I understood what he meant. Don't even disturb birds in their nests, which means you are an army who are allowed to go and fight to establish justice. So don't act like savages, just be disciplined. Never destroy uh, infrastructures, we said this. Never mutilate bodies of enemies dead or alive. After the first battle, Umar ibn Khattab, one of the great companions of Prophet Muhammad came, saying, oh, Prophet of Allah, I have good news. He said, what? He said, do you know who is among the prisoners? He said, who? He said, Suhail ibn Amr himself, the biggest propagandist, the one who uses like the biggest, you know, uh, leader of the media of Islamophobia against Islam. He said, the one who is making all the time speeches, encouraging the tribes of Arabia to fight the Muslims. Oh, Prophet of Allah, let's get rid of him. The Prophet said, I don't kill prisoners of war. He said, I know that, but that's not any prisoner of war. This is Suhail ibn Amr himself. He said, Omar, I'm not killing him. He said, okay, I have an opinion. Just listen to what he really suggested. He said, we are not going to kill him. We will just break his two incisors, just do those two teeth. So when he speaks, he will speak funny, saying, Islam, Muslims, and people will be laughing when he speaks. So like that, he will never be able to make any speech against Islam. The Prophet said, no, Omar, I'm not allowed to even mutilate a body or Allah will be mutilating my body, even if I'm a prophet. Houses of worship. Women, the children, and the elderly should be protected from any harm. Actually, there's a verse in the Quran that says, had not Allah make it possible that some people push other people, which means fight people, many monasteries, synagogues, churches, and mosques where the name of Allah is commemorated a lot, could have been demolished, which means one of the grounds of jihad in Islam is to protect houses of worship of other religions that we even differ with them. But this is to grant them freedom of religion, freedom of worship. Always bury all dead with respect. Actually, if the enemy fled the battlefield, leaving their dead behind them, it is the responsibility of the Muslim army to bury the dead of the enemy like they bury their own dead. They're not allowed to leave them to be eaten by the eagles or the hyena or anything. And that's 1,400 years before the Geneva Convention. I challenge you. Go to www.un.org, download the Geneva Convention. If you find anything more than this, I'll give each one of you 100 euros. Do it. And this is a very important verse. 
The intention in jihad is not actually to kill the enemy, it's to establish justice. So if justice will be established through peaceful means, then there is no need for combative jihad or fighting. The verse says, so if they withdraw from you and fight not against you and offer you peace, then Allah has opened no way for you against them, which means Muslims, you are not allowed to fight if the enemy wants peace. Which means that according to Islam, Islam is a religion of justice. And justice can be established through peaceful means or warfare. Muslims have to exhaust every possible peaceful mean. Only if they fail to establish justice through peaceful means, they will unfortunately go to war. But they have to exhaust every possible peaceful mean. And the verse is crystal clear in the Quran. Uh, this is very important, actually. What is the uh, relationship between the faith of the enemy and jihad? Do Muslims fight people because they are non-Muslims? No. Can Muslims fight people who are Muslims? Sure, if they are oppressors. The verse crystal uh, is very clear, saying, and if two groups among the believers fall to fighting each other, then reconcile between them both. But if one of them still rebels against the other, then fight you all against the one that which rebels until it complies, which means that Muslims here will be fighting a group of Muslims because they are the oppressors. So it's not, doesn't matter who's Muslim and who's not. What matters is who's an oppressor and who is oppressed. Is it an obligation to fight for your rights? Actually, I'm a graduate of a Catholic school. 12 years, I studied uh, with, with the Christians in Egypt and they are my friends until today, I have many friends. And I have seen many Christians wondering and asking in the churches about two verses in the Bible. The first one is in the Old Testament, which is called the Law of Moses. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The second one is in the New Testament, which is called the concept of forgiveness of Jesus Christ, which is uh, turn the left cheek to the one who slapped you on the right cheek. And they say, which one? should we apply? They are contradicting. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Or should I turn the left cheek to the one who's tapping on the right cheek? And the answer was always from the church leaders, of course we as Christians should apply the New Testament. It's new. The Old Testament is the Old Testament. We turn the left cheek. But when I read the Quran, I found that both concepts are not contradicting. The Quran explains both concepts, actually. We have a chapter called Ashura, which means the consultation in the Quran. There are three verses in this chapter that are explaining those two concepts in the Bible. The first one says, and indeed, whosoever takes revenge after he has suffered wrong against such, there is no blame, which means no one can blame anyone who is oppressed and he decides to apply an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. No one can blame him. Okay, on who should the blame be? The blame is only against those who oppress men with wrongdoing and insolently transgress beyond bounds. So the blame is on the oppressor. Good. What does Allah recommend? The third verse says, and whosoever shows patience and forgiveness, that would truly be recommended by Allah. Which means, in Islam, you are not forced to forgive. It is recommended if you forgive. You are allowed to apply an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but the law has to give you a space to forgive if you decide to forgive. Because we are not robots. In one hand, there are no two similar fingers. Why would you think that all people are similar? Some can forgive and some not. And even those who can forgive, sometimes they, the wound can be too deep and they may not be able to forgive. Actually, the law in any country cannot be based on the concept of forgiveness. You can't make the law in this country like that. If you slap someone on the right cheek and he doesn't turn the left cheek to you, call the police and say, he's not giving me the left cheek. You cannot. The law has to be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But the law has to give, according to Islam, a space to the one who was oppressed to forgive if he feels like he wants to do so, which is recommended by Allah. Now, the last thing, which is, does Islam recommend fighting at any time? Does Islam actually obligate fighting on Muslims? Yes, in one case. 
before I tell you which case is this, let's discuss first what is the difference between violence and terrorism. Can we say that violence is what two enemies are doing directly against each other, while terrorism is violence, but not against the enemy directly. Terrorism is violence against the weak people. To put pressure on the enemy indirectly, which means that those people who killed the 3,000 people in the towers in New York, they actually did not have a problem with them, but they wanted to put pressure on the enemy, but indirectly, by putting, by applying justice, by, apply, by, by actually applying violence on weak people, on armed people, civilians. Those who killed the uh, quarter of a million Japanese in Hiroshima and Nagasaki did not really have a problem with them. The problem was with the enemy, which is the Japanese government. So they had to put violence on those weak people in order to put pressure on the enemy indirectly. So do you agree with me that Terrorism is a subset of violence. Terrorism is violence, but against the weak. Do you agree on this? Okay. Look at this verse. God says in the Quran, blaming Muslims if they don't fight in this case. And what is wrong with you that you fight not in the cause of Allah and for those weak, ill-treated, and oppressed among men, women, and children? What did we say the weak are suffering from? Huh? Terrorism. Do you need coffee? Terrorism. So God is saying, how come you don't fight terrorism? Actually, this means that the word jihad doesn't mean terrorism. The word jihad means war on terrorism. And I mean the real war on terrorism, not war for oil and then claiming to be war on terrorism. No, the real war on terrorism. That's why Muslims like the word jihad. But can we say after all this that Islam is a religion of peace? Definitely. Because peace is one of the names of God in Islam. If I say that it's not a religion of peace, it's as if I'm saying it's not a religion of God. No, excuse me. We have a whole chapter in the Quran called Al-Fatih, which means the manifest victory. This chapter starts like that. Surely we have granted you a manifest victory. Do you know in which battle was this victory? That was a peace treaty called Al-Hudaybiyah peace treaty. So what do you think about a book that calls a peace treaty a manifest victory. Is this book trying to promote peace or war? Uh, the most beautiful names in Islam are the 99 names of God. Among them is as salam which means peace. The nastiest names. Prophet Muhammad said the ugliest two names are war and bitterness. Never use them to name your children. What do you think about a religion that, call, that, that tells its followers that the best name is peace and the worst name is war. Is it a religion trying to promote peace or war? What is the standard greeting of Muslims? War be upon you? Peace be upon you. Muslims want to go ultimately to paradise. Paradise name is called Dar es Salaam, which means the abode of peace. So, and so many evidence that I have, but I don't want to take more time from the discussion time that Islam is a religion of peace. But I have to conclude by saying Islam is also a religion of justice. Justice has to be established through peaceful means. Only if Muslims fail to establish justice through peaceful means, they are allowed to go to war. And I'm saying unfortunately because the Quran itself acknowledges that war is something that Muslims dislike, saying war in this case is prescribed upon you even though you dislike it. But sometimes you hate things that are needed for you. That's it. Like that, I finished my presentation.